for coming out on a, such a beautiful afternoon. I know that there are, there are things that one does at college on beautiful afternoons like this, and I'm very happy to, uh, to see you all here. My name is Anthony Marta. I'm the Associate Director of the NAMIC Institute for European Studies here on campus. My, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you. Um, Father Jenkins, the President of Notre Dame, sends his highest regards. He would have been here his bound this evening to work with the Notre Dame Board of Trustees. So he sends his sincere regrets. Uh, and Professor Brad, uh, Father Jenkins extends a very warm welcome to you as well. And hopes you can enjoy your visit with us. The Institute, in turn, would like to thank several people, some of whom I hope are here. The first is James Tussing. Is James here? Yes. No. There. Very good. Thank you, James. Uh, for the work on this invitation, uh, to Ethan Guardiardo, to our crack medic staff, uh, and to Professor John Cadini, who has agreed to say a few words of introduction. One point of housekeeping, though, before we begin, you can see that there are two microphones down here by the end of the, uh, the aisle. We will have time for question and answer afterwards. So if you please come down to these microphones to ask a question, that would be great. It makes it easier to record, and it makes it much easier to hear. All right, so to introduce uh, the evening tonight. Tensions between religion and secularization represent one of the Nanduk interests, one of the Nanduk Institute's four main research interests. And typically we're interested, as you might imagine, in the European instances of this tension past and present. But as we know, domestic and, and world events today keep this tension not only close to where we live, but urgent. One person among many who grapples with that tension on the ground, so to speak, is Joan Cadigany, former chair uh, of the Department of Theology. This Cadigany has published extensively on the theology of the early church, as you know, as well as on sacramental, pastoral, and catechetical theology. In recognition of his work, he was appointed by Pope Benedict to a five-year term on the International Theological Commission. Uh, and currently, he serves as the director of the Institute of Church Life, the mission, the mission of which is, quote, to implement the mission of transforming the church and society in light of the gospel. Professor Cadigany would you kindly say a, a, a few words to introduce our distinguished guest. Thank you.
Remy Braun is one of the few scholars alive who is equally an expert on medieval Arabic, Jewish, and Latin philosophy, as well as on ancient Greek philosophy. He is an extraordinary linguist in both ancient and modern languages, which enables a truly subtle analysis of texts and ideas. The legend of the Middle Ages demonstrates his special ability to discover profound philosophical implications in notions and questions in medieval texts that modern scholars would usually pass over. Thus, Kent Henry. Finally, and forthcoming very soon, in English, a book intriguingly titled On the God of the Christians and one or two others. <laughs> Professor Broad, most recently honored as one of the two recipients of the Ratzinger Prize, along with our own Brian Daly, has also been honored by both the French National Center for Scientific Research and Academy of Moral and Political Science. We are, friends, in turn, honored by his presence with us this evening. <clears throat> I'm sure you'll all join me in welcoming Professor Remy Braque to the University of Notre Dame. Or it 
finishes us with a precious hint, a very funny hint at the same time. First, I think uh, I venture some words on the very term secularism, and then on the word from which it most obviously stems, i.e. the Latin word saeculum. As for secularism, it looks like that the term was launched for the first time in English in the early 50s of the 19th century by a British author, no, well, very much in oblivion, by the name George Jacob Holy Oak. Holy Oak, Holy like Holy and Oak like the tree. <laughs> One of his main works, published in 1870, has the title of The Principles of Secularism. And here we have secularism as a full-fledged system. But he may have coined the word as early as 1846, in the 50s of the 19th century. Are some sort of turning point in the intellectual history of Europe. It's interesting that the uh, uh, world came up uh, precisely during this decade. In 1859, a far more celebrated personality of the intellectual life, the philosopher John Stuart Mill, was still feeling the world as a neologism. After mentioning that's in On Liberty, it's not in a remote and hidden place, it's quite, quite a famous work. Uh, well, in chapter 2, uh, he uh, asks a question about the principles that can lead human action, and he first mentions the religious principles, and then he speaks of, quote, secular standards. Brackets, as for want of a better name, they may be called. He's not yet quite sure about the legitimacy of, uh, its, of his coining such a word, but the OED knows better and tells us that Holy Oak was the first one who did that. <laughs> uh, people who uh, minted the word secularism were, first of all, eager to avoid another term, atheism. In Victorian England, atheism was, to put it in Victorian terms, hardly the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and the word was spelled as rude. In the same intellectual atmosphere, the biologist Thomas Huxley, the famous Darwin's Order, launched agnosticism in 1868 during a memorable discussion that took place in the Metaphysical Society. And in present day Britain, they often use in the same meaning and with the same intention a third word that was coined approximately at the same period of time, i.e., humanism. Humanism is when you say, well, uh, we have a board of uh, people, religious and humanist people. Humanist means well, have no religion. This being said, it is interesting to ask why we use just this word. Where is its precise shape of meaning? And words have their own logic. As for its origin, the word, uh, not uh, sorry, the word secular, I'm shifting now to uh, a, uh, the etymology of, of the word that is the etymology of secularism, the etymology of secular mood. Well, the origin of secular is a Christian one. 
And it depends on the distinction made between two kinds of clerics, regular and secular. Interestingly, the words that are meant to express secularization are in themselves Christian words that were submitted to a first process of secularization before the real, the sociological, or the intellectual, or the, or the uh, sorry, or the religious, or a religious secularization comes an intellectual, a conceptual secularization of the words. There is another example which is familiar to native speakers of French. Of French. This is the adjective like of the Italian equivalent like or which means at present, well, somebody who doesn't pay attention to religion, somebody who is eager to draw a sharp dividing line between the religious and the political, for instance, your wall of separation. Uh, but uh, the word originally, well, means something very precise in the uh, structure of the Christian church, i.e. people who happen to receive the holy orders. And so the thing that designates the word secularism, the debate for which it was coined, is a false one. For secularist people imagine that religion is the origin of moral precepts, and that it is opposite to show that such precepts can be known without any particular revelation by God. In other terms, in order to have a well-oiled society, in order to have harmonious uh, relations between uh, human beings, you need no religion. Well, this is precisely what Christianity has been laying stress on explicitly since Paul's episode to the Romans, chapter 2, and implicitly since Jesus himself wrote, uh, sorry, uh, Paul uh, uh, laying the stress on the fact that they are decent pagans who have not the foggiest idea about Moses' law. Hence, arises the question of how is this possible? There must be some other purely non-mosaic principle. And in this context, Paul invents sort of, the idea of a moral conscience. Sumerius. Advocates of secularism are, this is very much to their credit, excusable for many Christians of their time, i.e. of the 19th century, the thought that they could defend religion by arguing that it can't be dispensed with for ensuring the multiplication of man. It was a common theme of 19th century apologetics. Without religion, the society will crumble down, will fall apart, people will slit each other's throats, and so on and so forth. Well now, back to the word psychulum. Psychulum is a Latin word from which then in Roman languages words for century, or the period of time. Siècle, my native French, secolo, siglo. The word received from Christianity a particular shade of meaning. In the vocabulary of the Church Fathers, it designates the world, such as Christianity conceives of it. And it is interesting that this concept is rather chronological in nature than spatial. In order to name the world, well, we could, uh, well, uh, we could take our bearings from some spatial representation, the spreading of things, or perhaps light that makes possible their spreading, their getting uh, a as in this 
that in languages in which the word for word, uh, for world, and for light is uh, more often than not the same. In Christianity, the stress is laid on the transitory character, the provisional character of the present state of affairs. This world is something that passes away, that slowly disappears and is supposed to make place for another better state of things. By the token, the Christian writers remained very much in the wake of the Jewish use of the Hebrew word olam and of the Greek word ayon that often renders it in the Septuaginta translation of the Bible. Cyclum is thereby diametrically opposed to the Greek cosmos, i.e. to the beautiful world order that was believed to be everlasting. Eternity of the cosmos, the eternity not only of matter or of things, but of the, the order of things is a basic tenet of Aristotle's thought as Silvanus. Later on only, the word seculum came to designate a century, i.e. 100 years. This semantic evolution did not happen by chance, for 100 years are not just any length of time. This is what I will try to show briefly. 100 years are 70 plus 30, i.e. what we get when we add a generation, 30 years, and the traditional duration of human life, according to the Psalm 90, 70 years. One century is thereby the halo, the, 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 the aura of possible experience that surrounds the life of the individual. This is the longest hope we can have. In ancient Rome, there were the so-called secular games, ludi seculares, and the herald that announced them proclaimed with great solemnity that nobody who witnessed them saw them already, nor would see them one more time. The formula is quoted by Suetonius, uh, this, uh, well, sorry, teller, uh, about uh, one of the most scandalous signs of the Roman emperors, and he does that once more in a highly ironical context. Rundi quos nex spectacet quisum nex spectatus esset. Another historian, one of the uh, authors of the so called Historia Augusta, Herodian, wrote People then called these things secular, the Greek is Ionios, from Ion, because they had heard they were celebrated only after three generations had elapsed. <coughs> Heralds would go all over Rome and Italy, inviting people to come and see a spectacle that nobody ever saw and nobody would see again. Hamete Aegon Mete Opsontai. In the direction of the past, one century is the limit of the living remembrances of the ego. I can keep a remembrance of my grandparents and more certain of my great grandparents. One century is the limit of living memory, i.e., what my grandfather told me and that I can tell my grandchildren. In the direction of the future to one century is the limit of the concrete care of the ego. I very well can, nay, I should think about the future situation of my children, of my grandchildren, possibly my great-grandchildren. On the other hand, I don't care that much. I can't about the generations that will come afterwards. <laughs> if by some miracle and the remote forebears came back to life, or if 
in a tricky way have a remote posterity where never, by uh, some miracle, uh, called to life those people that have mean a great deal for us from the present day ego. This hardly and viable destiny is forced in swift, gullible struggles of the wretched immortals, the wretched immortals of the country of Lugnai, those who the author Swift calls strong drugs. I don't know how it's supposed to be pronounced exactly. Till the 30th year, the space of a generation, they behave like normal mortals. But the later ones suffer from a melancholy that keeps growing until they reach the age of 80 years. In Lugnak, as elsewhere, this age is normally the highest limit of the life expectation, statistically speaking. When they reach it, those poor immortals are considered as legally dead. They forfeit every right to their property that fall to their heirs. The natural affection doesn't extend beyond the grandchildren, and after 200 years, they already hardly understand the language of their fellow country. Gloomy perspective, you know, this idea of the, of the impossibility of death, this horrible thing, according to Swift. In the field of law, 200 years are the highest limit. It constitutes the longest possible duration for a contract, for instance, a lease. And this is what is known by legal scholars, interestingly, as the tempus memoratum, uh, time that we can keep in our memories. And the longest possible contract, for which there is a word of art, emphitoitic, holds good for 99 years. And the almost the same. Beyond that, one enters the field of the immemorial. The subject of such immemorial rights is not the individual person any longer, but some impersonal entity, for instance the state. A common saying of ancient French law, which is known as the Brancard, says, well, qui voit du roi la plume, cent ans après en rend la plume who plucked the king's goose, hundred years later gives back its feathers. This means that for crimes against the state, no prescription ever obtains. But this is beyond the possibilities of the experience of the ego, of the individual. Well, that, what the heck does all this stuff have to do with the idea of a secular society? <laughs> In the teeth of all appearances, the relationship is a close one. And this can be shown if you reflect on a peculiarity of my native French language. The French language possesses two different adjectives. On the one hand, we have séculier, and on the other hand, séculaire. English does not distinguish. You say secular. And with it, other languages like the Italian secolare or the Spanish secolare. Séculaire in French means what lasts for more than one century, say a tree or a custom. Séculier designated originally a cleric who doesn't live according to the rule of the monastic order, I've already alluded to this distinction, in a convent or as a hermit, but in the world. Now, he has added the meaning of who or what renounces every transcendence, the same as the English secular such as secularists or people understand it. Now, it seems to me that the irony of language, to which I already alluded, the irony of language, the inner logic of words, lets the prediction that etymology implicitly contains come true. 
I say, a secularist is a person the inner logic of whose position would compel, suppose he or she were consequent, would compel to act as if mankind were not to last longer than one century. And even worse, a secularist is a person whose behavior, provided that it were consequent and universalized, would make that mankind wouldn't last more than one century. Why is this the case? In order to understand that, let me now turn towards the second notion which I wanted to shed light on, i.e. the very idea of a society. This enables me to introduce my second, to repeat my second thesis. The term secular society is up to a point tautological. Secularity is the outcome of a movement that originates in the very way in which human community took the name of society. Well, after this uh, brief exposition in my uh, sonata, let's have a look at society as a closed space. But in the last analysis, the very fact that one designates human community by the name of society, which is for us well, self-evident, already is a symptom of something. In former times, one spoke of the city, in Greek, polis, hence other words, politics. In ancient and medieval Latin, chiwitas, in the Arabic of the same period, Madina. Why then, the, why then do we speak of this as a society? The idea of a society is economic, not politic, but economic in origin. A societas in Latin is a grouping of men who agree to unite their abilities and their efforts towards the same goal that is more often than not commercial in nature. And it would be interesting if I can't um, well, waste time doing that to ask in which circumstances the word came to take its present meaning. I'll give you only one example. One example on which one can notice the shift from the meaning, from a meaning to the other one, I mean from the economy, original economic meaning to the present day, well, sociological, that's tautology, <laughs> uh, in the 18th century. Uh, I will quote a uh, saying by the German philosopher Christian Wolff, who was hugely influential in the whole 18th century. When men unite with each other, in order to promote their greater good by uniting their forces, they enter with each other in a society. Both of them. As a consequence, society is nothing else than a contract between some people for them to promote their, in their greater good by uniting their forces. Well, this sounds like a repetition. In fact, there is a very important move. I need a shift from a society to society without article, which means the society. The passage from the indefinite article to the absence of article that stands for the definite character of the remains without explanation. For it is strange that this extension of meaning should have taken place. Between the grouping that we designate by means of this one word of society, i.e. the commercial society, company, and what we call that society, the difference does not concern only the quantity 
of constitutive elements. The ways in which those two groups come to be are worlds apart, for a commercial society, a company, results from the agreement of its members, and it dissolves itself if those members happen to have diverging interests. On the contrary, properly speaking, human community, in the political meaning of this term, never constitutes itself. It discovers itself as already there, as already extant, and it perpetuates itself by renewing itself through a process of intussusception of new members, by letting new members come in unseasonably. Only exceptionally do new members come from outside and coalesce around it. By and large, the members of this community arise from the community itself. The accretion of new members presupposes that there already exists a community that can welcome them. We have examples of rulers that let the subjects swear an oath of allegiance. So did the caliphs in Baghdad. Or more recently, so did John Calvin when he founded the new polity in Geneva. The idea according to which there exists between govern and govern a contract is well known to. The idea is medieval in origin and it appears probably as early as the late 11th century under the pen of an Alsatian monk by the name of Manigold of Nautenbach. This doctrine allows in particular to depose the rulers that infringe the contract that binds them to the people they are in charge of. In any case, never, never a human community that left traces in historical records constituted itself by the aggregation of independent individuals who predated it never anywhere else than in fiction. Hence the idea of a society has something to do, nay, has the closest relationship with a fictional character of the grounding myth of social life, i.e. the fiction of rather this became a word of art in political philosophy, a fiction of a social contract. This is a fiction that sticks its roots deep into ancient Epicureanism. For according to Epicurean, I mean Epicurus, or first Democritus, the Epicurus and Lucretius, whose work we possess with the uh, uh, Democritus and with Epicurus, you know, have less, uh, less uh, luck. We possess some the shreds of their works. But if we can reconstruct their social thought, men are supposed to have been produced from the earth by spontaneous generation. They simply arise. Uh, well, Earth has bubbles, says Van Gogh in Out of these bubbles arise not only witches, but men. They are supposed to have been roaming in the primeval forest and to have met almost by chance or to have been driven together by negative reasons. For instance, the necessity to repel wild beasts. This is in Democritus, well, in a fragment that we can trace back, the content of which we can trace back to Democritus. And this is again in Lucretius in Book 5. Now, modern political philosophy is very much in the wake of this implicit uh, Epicurean anthropology, for it conceives of sociality of the pattern of a group of acting subjects who came from nowhere in a purely human space. 
The ever recurring image of such a group is the group of players around the table. It is, by the way, quite interesting to observe that the comparison is exactly as old as the founder of modern political philosophy, Adam Thomas Hobbes. Quote, it is from Leviathan, uh, second book, chapter 30. It is, it is in the laws of the commonwealth, as in the laws of gaming, whatsoever, <coughs> whatsoever the gamers all agree on is injustice to none of them. The same image is to be found again in the work of Adam Smith, who speaks of the great chessboard of human society. And such an image generalizes in later authors, including our contemporary, but well, recently uh, deceased John Rawls, when he describes the initial state, we have people around the green table, uh, the, the, the table of green cloth. To be sure, for the representatives of political philosophy of the classical age, I thought, the narrative there, but also the narrative about the original contract was hardly more than an explanatory fiction, and for the most part it was conceived as such. Now, <coughs> real history took political theory more seriously than it itself did. For the evolution of our society is made of them something that more and more resembles a club of gamblers. This, there is a very penetrating observation in the work of an old friend of mine who has already quite a name in his country, Pierre Manin. Uh, he observes that uh, the idea of a state of nature that was originally um, well, a myth of sorts, a fiction, well, has some sort of tendency to, to, to come true. To come true, i.e. relationships that are the same as uh, the same among real existing individuals in our present day societies and that were supposed to have been in this, uh, well, uh, mythical history or prehistory. Now, to come back to the uh, image of the game, for the game to be fair, you have to exclude every intervention from the outside. And for this reason, the space of a democratic society, societies in which we are happy to live, to live, the space of our democratic society is flat. In so far as nobody is allowed, in the initial situation at least, to stand higher than the other ones. The democratic social space is not only flat, but it is closed. And it is closed because it is and has to be flat. It must be closed for it to be able to be flat. When it's outside, should be excluded. And first of all, the great outsider, whatever claims to have worth and authority in itself, whatever claims to be able to confer an authority on this member, in contradistinction to other members, which should make a bump on the flat surface of society. Democratic space must remain inside of itself, or to put it in Latin, or in a Latin word that became English, it must be immanent. Tocqueville noticed that aristocratic man was constantly sent back to something that is placed outside of him. Democratic man, on the other hand, refers only to himself. This is illustrated by a famous anecdote, although 
its authenticity is not above doubt. When in 1787, the Congress of this country, the Congress, had somehow painted itself into a corner, Benjamin Franklin suggested that prayers be said to the Father of Lights, so that he could not send light on the minds of the people who really were at a loss what to do. Then Alexander Hamilton is said, probably wrongly, to have called and said that he did not see the necessity of calling in foreign aid. <laughs> Beyond this script, we could take up at this level the famous paradox of the French philosopher Pierre Bayle and radicalize it. Pierre Bayle had himself taken up a more ancient paradox, first formulated by Plutarch, according to whom a theism is more worth than superstition. For Plutarch, uh, a theism was more, more worth than superstition because it was less offensive uh, vis-a-vis God than perhaps ascribing to the deity uh, well, properties that well, were not uh, well, possible, maybe. cruel God, and unjust God, and so on and so forth. It's better to say there's no God at all than to say that well, God is some sort of horrible tyrant and so on. Bell transposed the paradox from the level of the individual, of the individual of the faith, or lack of faith, of the individual to the collective level. And he tried to show that a society of the theists is possible. And not only possible, but that a society of atheists would be more docile, more pliable than a society of religious enthusiasts who would claim to receive well, messages from God telling them they have to do this or to avoid that and so on. I would like to go first. A democratic society, not in so far as it is democratic, which is a regime among other possible regimes, but in so far as it is a society, it must be atheistic in order to be perfectly right. And here we stumble an, an antinomy. In so far as the human grouping governs itself in, in a democratic way, it must be open to transcendence. Well, I will have opportunity perhaps to say more words of that. Let me take this here for granted provisionally. But insofar as this grouping understands itself as a society, it has on the contrary to be closed upon itself. Well, in the framework of modern political philosophy, the central problem is to guarantee the peaceful coexistence of such a closed group. Therefore, when we have to contrive rules enabling everybody to maximize their gains without their harming the other ones. And this coexistence presupposes by definition that men already exist. There is no coexistence if there is no existing together, if there is no existence, if there is no existing whatsoever. Now, the individual existence of man is temporary. It is limited and it lasts, as we saw it, at most one century. Now, men are individuals of a determined biological species. And the human species, the same as the other living species, keeps going by replacing the individuals that disappear by new individuals, by new individuals begotten by individuals. The species is sort of surfing of individuals that come up and then disappear, come to be 
uh, wither. Hence, when witnesses the appearance of a tension between the idea of man, i.e. as member of a species, and the idea of citizen, i.e. as member of a society. This is quite an old story. Such a tension was already pointed out by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and later on, the young Karl Marx took it up in another key. He reflects on the weird spirit that is supposed by the title of the cornerstone document of the early French Revolution, i.e. the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. 1789, to be sure. The rights of man and of the citizens. Why are there two, two concepts here? His critique and Marx's critique bears on the opposition between the egoistic individual and society. But both individuals as well as society have the same root, a root that Marx designates as the fact that man is a generic reality, Gattungswesen, and this generic reality is what he calls most explicitly society desertion. As a consequence, man is not the adequate substrate of democracy any longer. As a biological species, Man can't achieve the ideal conditions that a perfect democracy would require. <clears throat> this ideal substrate of democracy, this ideal citizen, would be far more the angel. The angel. In a famous passage from his writing on perpetual peace, Kant, great German philosopher, Kant explains that the problem of building a just society can very well be solved, even in the case of a society of debtors. For it is enough that those utterly evil and utterly egoistic beings should be intelligent enough for them to understand that their interest is to neutralize each other. And they will get a balance without any uh, moral underpinnings. The simple fact that we, those imaginary devils, would understand that it is in their interest not to each, not to eat up each other. This is enough for them to constitute a viable society. And it is in their interest not to slit uh, each other's throats, or I don't know what devils can do to, to each other, or to devour uh, each other. They will do that, they will refrain from doing that simply because devil A will understand that if he well, attacks devil B, devil B will be able to attack uh, him or her. <laughs> and this, for this reason, the uh, uh, political problem is soluble in the case of a society of devils. But beyond what Kant explicitly says, this passage sounds to my ears like some sort of Freudian slip, an avowal of sorts. But I should add that to some extent, the problem is easier in the case of devils. Devils, according to good theology, are angels, fallen angels to be sure, but they partake in the angelic nature. And as a consequence of the angelic nature, there are pure spirits that as such soar in a 
special kind of temporality, the so-called I rule by legal scholars, and this enables them to shirk the need to reproduce. And we need to do that. But what is required for mankind to go on existing? That is, since mankind is not made of pure spirits, what is required for human beings to go on begetting children? One could mention many things, different in nature, economic and social conditions, legal measures, psychological atmosphere of society, and so on and so forth. All this does and fall within the philosopher's province, but comes within a whole array of fields for which I don't possess any competence. For this I will leave this aside. But on the other hand, the philosopher must ask what is required for responsibles of all kind to have the will to influence those conditions so that mankind might want to go on existing. Now, this will supposes two things, i.e. a glance and a choice. On the one hand, it supposes that some people begin to look farther than one century, i.e. beyond what an individual can experience. What will happen when my grandchildren will be dead? What will happen with the people whom I can, uh, well, who, whose I can have a living experience will be away. We could say, well, never mind. If we do that, we are secularists. And, well, our prophecy, so to speak, will be self-fulfilling. But on the other hand, this supposes a choice. A choice that I can't qualify with any, by means of any better adjective than metaphysical. This choice consists in saying that it is good that there should exist human beings on the earth. I say good in itself. I don't say fun for the present generation. The fact that life is in its whole rather on the fun side is no argument because it holds true for well, our other selves exclusively, not for mankind generally meaning. Perhaps it holds true only for special kinds of lucky people. Certainly not for the human species as a whole. Now, this sentence about the goodness of man's existence, who is empowered to pronounce it? Certainly not man himself, him or herself. We can remember a sentence by the French philosopher Jean Paul Sartre on this point. That's what he wrote in a well, short conference he gave right after the, the end of the Second World War. By the title, which was published by the title Existentialism is a Humanism, a highly paradoxical title, by the way, since stuff shows that humanism, uh, well, can't have any of the received meanings of the world, simply it means that man has to, well, make his or her own destiny out of what, that's a question that he doesn't ask. And Sartre writes, we can't admit that a man might pronounce a sentence on man. But the context is rather funny, you know, he's quoting uh, a saying by the French poet and artist, a multi-talented fellow by the name of Jean Cocteau. Jean Cocteau was sitting 
in an aircraft and flying over a mountain, enjoying the beautiful landscape and exclaiming in front of the technical abilities of uh, human beings, man is terrific. No mitipato. And then Sartre adds with his smile on this. Oh, very good, but uh, does this saying come from the mouth of a, a horse or of a dog or of some uh, uh, impartial observer, a <laughs> biased observer? No. Man says that man is fantastic. Well, little wonder. <laughs> <laughs> the only being who can pronounce a, an authorized yes, an authorized uh, affirmation of man, is the one who declared at the last day of creation that whatever he had created was not only good, but taken in its soul very good. Thank you so much. Yeah, this 
principles when man, when man, when goes and so on and so forth. Okay. Then I have no quarrel. I have no quarrel against the uh, democratic system. I am happy to say uh, if I am a citizen of a democratic country, even if I don't uh, always agree with the decisions uh, of uh, the uh, leaders. And well, your second of the first in the order, uh, in the chronological order, the very meaning of life. Well, this is a uh, an idea that has become uh, tried uh, among people who are not satisfied with the present day state of affairs in our societies. Our societies well, are not perfect, and it is interesting to ask why. Um, what is objected against our present day way of life is lack of meaning. What kind of reality um, is here um, alluded to? in a symptomatic way. I would interpret the search for meaning of life more as a symptom uh, as, um, than uh, as, a, uh, as the right way to ask the question. For the following reason, let me be brief. Uh, when you say, well, life must have a meaning, you presuppose that there is a right side, life, and on the other side, meaning. If we speak of the meaning, uh, we must be able to distinguish between, for instance, where the, the sounds of the word and its meaning. There is on the one side uh, some well, phonic elements, like in the word, well, let's say secular, and there is a meaning, secular, I -E -S -E -C -U, a set of sounds. And on the other hand, there is a meaning. If we take our bearings from the assumption that the meaning of life is external to life such as we live it, then we implicitly deprive life of its worth. For we must think that what is interesting, what is uh, well, relevant in life, lies outside of it, i.e. in its meaning. I would be more in favor of uh, an endeavor to look inside of life its own meaning, its own value. And this is, by the way, according to my interpretation, the meaning of the Christian idea of eternal life. Christianity doesn't pretend to uncover the meaning of life, but to grant us eternal life, which is something completely different. And well, uh, I have some reservations against the, uh, this uh, habit of asking about the meaning of life. Our life is meaningless and so on and so forth. No, we have to reveal that it contains its own meaning, that it opens up uh, to, uh, a, uh, to something that is life itself, but so sort of potentialized. And there is this beautiful saying by Fichte, uh, where it kills is not death, but a more living life, a more lively life. That must be in the destination of I'm uh, not that sure. I would look in this direction rather than hopping uh, on the theme Thank you very much. I learned a, a, I learned a tremendous amount. Um, 
But this, I, I wonder though if there might be a slippage between um, a very interesting etymological point and uh, contemporary usage of the term secular um, with sort of sociological descriptions. I, I just find it hard to believe that the vast majority of secular atheist agnostics of, of this writing, I'm sure you're aware, would say they're only concerned about the next hundred years. I mean, it seems to me the vast majority of them are concerned about much more time. I mean, I'm sure there are atheist libertines, but it seems to be a pretty unfair characterization of them to, to portray the majority of them as only concerned about a hundred years. I, I think about, for example, Charles Taylor's description of secularism in his recent book, um, in which he describes a very sort of thick, rich morality to contemporary secularism. Um, so I was wondering if you could clarify, clarify. Okay, I'd like to do that. Uh, well, I most confessedly read Charles Taylor's book uh, from cover to cover, 800 pages in English. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Taylor's a very nice man. But... Okay. I think he's a serious Okay, sure, no, but let's get back to, to, the, to our atheist. My atheist uh, is fictional. I'm trying to understand what the inner logic of theism is driving at. And I'm supposing that uh, this uh, theist who may exist or may not exist, that's a matter of indifference, is consequent. Uh, well, if you uh, organize, let's say, a poll, uh, if you ask people about their religious belief or um, belief, and if you get uh, people who describe themselves as atheists or through other more flowery terms like secular or something like that. And if you ask them, well, do you care for what will happen after 100 years, they probably would say, yes, we do. And we try to prepare a better future for uh, the next generations, which is very much to their credit. But my question is whether they are, when they do that, not better, I mean morally better, than their own principles enable them to be. Are the consequences when they do that? This is, by the way, well, I would hate to, to give the impression of a spoken father, Charles Taylor. This is a basic idea in Taylor. The theist thinkers are morally better than their philosophical assumptions would allow them to be. And well, I happen to have stumbled uh, some years ago while preparing the book that I hope to be able uh, to finish in the near future, to stumble upon the work of a French thinker, which is at present totally forgotten, a, um, a biologist not a, a, a real natural scientist uh, who came from Brittany. He has the 100% uh, name that betrays that, Le Dantec. Le Dantec. And he came up in 1907 with a booklet by the title of The Theism. That is, that's the principles of his thought. And what he says, very clearly, if uh, mankind were consequently uh, a theist, this would lead to uh, collective euthanasia. This would lead to collective suicide. And then he adds, fortunately, I feel in myself a set of prejudices, prejudices inherited from my uh, Gallic or Britonic uh, ancestors that run me through life. We have here a perfect example of a dichotomy between uh, well, the logic of a philosophical or allegedly scientific 
of vulgarized scientific system on the one hand, and on the other hand, where the heritage of uh, well moral judgments that were made by previous generations that are inherited in that well somehow uh, color uh, our feelings and our judgments. Uh, well, the, the atheist uh, whom I try to describe is an ideal type to uh, take up Max Weber's uh, a phrase. I don't know whether there are such people, and uh, well, I don't know if things, but it's important to me is the logic of a philosophical position. And according to this logic, to repeat my conclusion, uh, well, a secularist has no, uh, how I put it, has no intellectual tools for him or her to answer the question whether it is good that there should be human beings and that we should keep producing new human beings in order to uh, replace uh, the old timers uh, who well, must go. Good Yeah. 
pigs that uh, well, uh, are not uh, not a uh, swine uh, in the derogatory meaning of the term, but simply simple beings, be beings with uh, the only elementary needs. Well, he presupposes that they are human beings. They are already there. And this is, by the way, the basic problem of well, political philosophy or political theory, let's say, generally, of political thought. If we suppose that they are human beings, how can we organize a system in which they will live peacefully, uh, they will uh, improve their lot, uh, they will uh, choose the best kind of leaders, the most the people who are, uh, are the most gifted for them to uh, uh, enable them to reach their goals. But all this presupposes that there are people, that they are already there. And my basic uh, well, the, the, the wedge that I'm trying to drive uh, into uh, the very body of political thought uh, is the difference between people who are already there and people who are not yet there. Uh, well, if you want, uh, this could be uh, the, uh, the, the symmetric idea uh, to uh, the conservative idea according to which uh, a nation consists of more dead people than living people. It's an old conservative idea which well, against uh, which I have no quarrel by the way. It's great truth in that. But I would shift the question from the consideration of the past to the consideration of the future. And to ask well, on which basis are we allowed to further the existence of mankind? Once we have answered this question in a positive way, then we have to ask how can we organize the being together with those people? But we first have to answer, well, how is it that there must be people? The question how they have to be, i.e., how they have to behave together, <coughs> uh, they have to behave uh, towards each other, is a second question. And we first have to, to say, well, uh, must there be a mankind? And suppose there is a mankind, then we we'll have to uh, uh, set to brass tacks and to uh, answer the question about the way in which we can make their life well, better. Uh, I'm trying to sort of to subvert, you know, this, uh, uh, the whole building of uh, to sap <laughs> the whole building of political philosophy by introducing the question about the legitimacy of the existence of mankind. Professor, we have one more question. Thank you very much, Professor. I'm very intimidated to ask you a question. <laughs> um, so you referred to Tocqueville and how um, Tocqueville talks about sort of this flattening um, and that he has a passage about the aristocracy, of how the aristocracy always had something that they could provide um, a society that wasn't that, but something sort of like participation or transcendence or something that causes them to go back and think about that. And so you also said that you don't have a quarrel with a democratic regime. It's more of a term society. So I'm just curious, um, what can you envision for a democratic regime that wouldn't be a society? And the reason that I was interested in this is because in that passage in Tokyo when you brought that up, I think part of the thing about democracy and theism is that when the aristocrats didn't, when people realized that like the aristocrats didn't necessarily have anything that made them closer to God or closer to transcendence and the implications of this for government, then um, 
it's almost like part of that explanation fell out, but and sympathetic to to the criticism you made of society. So how would a democracy but within a society work? reasons, but, mm -hmm. well, let me first, uh, um, well, add perhaps a, a right uh, to what I said about democracy and, and aristocracy. I took aristocracy uh, in a rather wide meaning, which is Tocqueville's meaning. You know, Tocqueville uh, has the, uh, well, the cheek to <laughs> distinct, to classify uh, political regimes in two kinds only. There's democracy, which is not his object that he's really interested in, and the other, and on the other, whatever is not democratic, and that he calls, uh, well, in a loose way, uh, by the name of aristocracy. Aristocrat. That the an aristocrat would be, uh, in my uh, own definition, and in Tocqueville's, well, I can't compare myself, but still, there are two of us. <laughs> Tocqueville and my son, well, we both have some kind of points. Thank <laughs> you, both. Um, and well, uh, an aristocrat uh, is a person who uh, draws uh, his uh, legitimacy, he draws uh, the worth of the claims he or she makes from outside of the political realm, i.e. from uh, well, a reference to the deity or from a reference uh, to uh, the order of the cosmos or uh, from a reference to, well, most commonly uh, to the feats of his or her ancestors. An aristocrat is sort of necessarily uh, somebody who points out to realities that exceed the boundaries of what is there, the boundary of present time. Whereas democracy, and this is by the way very much uh, in Tocqueville, uh, well, there is in, um, well, to be sure, this work on uh, democracy in, in America, there is a sort, of, a sort of remake of the famous sentence by Edmund Burke, in which uh, Burke says that people who don't look backwards to their ancestors won't look forward to posterity. And Tocqueville sort of rephrases that as a description of the democratic man who doesn't give a dog, who doesn't pay attention to whatever exceeds from the sort of the club of the people who already are there. This is uh, uh, well the essence sort of, of democracy. And let me perhaps add the name uh, of uh, uh, another the thinker of the political and of the social, Jürgen Habermas. Jürgen Habermas has a description of the ideal situation, of the ideal functioning of a democratic society, which resembles very much the well, ideal image that I'm trying to draw, i.e. Uh, a space in which the only thing that has a worth are the arguments that are put forward. The origin of the arguments is irrelevant. Well, exactly as is in this theme, uh, since you mentioned uh, Plato with some great competence, there is this passage in the Protagoras uh, in which the sophist describes the functioning, perhaps the, that's uh, embellished to some extent, the functioning of uh, the Athenian. Um, assembly uh, of the people. They don't pay attention uh, to uh, whether the speaker is noble, uh, beautiful, uh, uh, young or old, uh, uh, male or female, uh, 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 uh,
circle. All those many people are supposed to be on the same level. And well, this is this sort of a ideal situation that comes back uh, in present day political reflection among people like Habermas. But even Habermas, in my opinion, doesn't pay enough attention to the fact that uh, the people who are there are uh, biological human beings who have to uh, find grounds for them to beget other ones. Reasons, good reasons. They are not allowed to leave everything to uh, instinct. Well, it's done, it's um, getting close to dinner time, so being biological <laughs> beings, would you please join me in, in uh, thanking you?